I don't want my knife to look like a CNC machine spit it out either. It is a handmade custom knife. I've never made the perfect knife. If I did happen to stumble on and make the perfect knife, I'd probably never make another knife. I'd probably be done. Mm -hmm. Where could I go from there? Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 64 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. It is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn about knives and knife collecting and Hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, anyone who loves knives and is in the knife game. We want to talk to them, and that's what our Sunday weekend edition of the Knife Junkie podcast is all about. And Bob, another great guest that we're going to hear from today. That's right. Today we're talking to custom knife maker Michael O'Mockerly. Uh, Michael O'Mockerly came onto my uh, radar in 2009 uh, with a 60 Minutes episode. Uh, it was, uh, there was a segment featuring DHL, the, the huge European, uh, shipping company. And their U.S. headquarters was in Ohio. I grew up in Ohio, incidentally, so it made my uh, antenna prick up. And, uh, DHL left Ohio and, uh, indeed left their U.S. operations, at least, uh, in terms of the size they were working with. And they left a few people in the lurch. And one of those people was Michael O'Markerly. He worked there at DHL. So they featured him on the 60 Minutes uh, segment, and uh, part of that feature was uh, talking about how he had a, a fallback plan, and his fallback plan is knife making. And of course, well, I grew up watching 60 Minutes with my folks, but uh, when I was out on my own, I sort of stopped, and just by sheer coincidence, I happened to watch it that one night, saw this uh, segment on The Knife Maker, and my brother also watched it simultaneously, and... Uh, I remember after the show ended, he called me. Did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, immediately called Michael O. Mockerly, knife maker, and ordered a knife, oh, as cool. did many, many others. And uh, his career as a as a, a worldwide collected knife maker was launched from that episode. So I decided to get in touch with him, and uh, we had a fantastic conversation. He's a, he's a great guy. Well, let's uh, listen to that interview coming up next. But first, just want to remind you that uh, we are on the uh, ending, if you will, of the Thanksgiving holiday, the Black Friday sales, the Cyber Monday sales, depending on when you're listening to this episode. Cyber Monday could be tomorrow, or it could be today if you're happening to listen to it uh, right when the show drops. If it's after that, well, sorry, because what I'm going to tell you is already out of date. But hey, still time for you to uh, take advantage of Black Friday Cyber Monday knife deals from our friends at the Knife Ship Free. If you go to the knifejunkie.com slash BFCM, that stands for Black Friday Cyber Monday. So the knifejunkie.com slash BFCM, you'll see all of the Black Friday Cyber Monday deals going on. Some great savings. So again, go to the knifejunkie.com slash BFCM. And uh, it's funny, uh, one of the knives I'm celebrating at, towards the end of the year, we're going to be doing a uh, most carried of 2019. And uh, one of those knives, the first knife I will feature on that episode, uh, was actually purchased by Knife Ship Free. They're one of my favorites. Cool. Visit the Knife Junkie at theknifejunkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos, and more. I'm here with Michael O'Mockerly to talk about forging knives and his career in knife making. Michael, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you. It's my pleasure. You know, you you came into my uh, onto my radar about well, 11 years ago when you were featured on a 60 Minutes story. Tell us about that story and tell us how uh, how 60 Minutes got got things going for your knife career. Well, I I worked at uh, DHL, the the shipping overnight shipping company, and they had came into our town a few years earlier and bought out Airborne Express. And uh, they employed 10,000 people, and we're a town of 11,000. So I was a bus driver, and we would drive to, you know, different areas and pick people up to come to work. And they announced that they were leaving. And 
it was going to completely close down and everybody was going to lose their jobs. And that was my full-time job right near the house. I had uh, really a pretty good part-time business making knives and had had quite a bit of coverage in magazines, but it was part-time, the same the same as most knife makers are. Uh, and I was riding my bus one night and uh, an older lady came on and she said, uh, did you know that 60 Minutes is in town? And I said, you mean the, the TV show? She said, yeah. I said, no, I hadn't heard anything about that. And she says, well, I told them about you. And I said, why in the name of our Lord and Savior would you tell them about me? And she said, well, you're, you're losing your job out here. And you've got a part-time business that you're probably going to have to lean on pretty hard. And she said, and we kind of feel that a German company is stomping on our freedoms. And she said, quite frankly, your son gave his life fighting for our freedoms. I'm a gold star parent. My son, Stephen, died November 2nd, 2003. I uh, was shot down in the Chinook helicopter over Fallujah. And I said, well, okay. And the next day, a lady called me from 60 Minutes. She talked to me for a few minutes. She called me the next day and said, we would like to put you on TV. And I thought, well, yeah, sure, right. I'm just a guy making knives in my backyard, you know. And I got a call the next day. They told me where to be, at what time. I sat down. There were cameras everywhere. And then Scott Pelley comes striding in. I thought, well. We just got pretty serious around here. <laughs> and he sat and we did a full interview for 60 minutes. The next day they came to my house and my shop and filmed all day. And when it aired, it was the first segment on that night. And the segments are usually 15 minutes. And it would, uh, it would show me and then it would show things around the town, then it would come back to me and, you know, just kept going that way. And it ended up with me and, uh, it went to commercial and it was off. And my wife and I were just kind of cracking up, you know, we were just on television <laughs> and my phone rang and it was a man from Texas and he was crying because of, you know, what I had said about my son. And he said, I want to order a knife. And I said, what kind? He said, I don't care. And I said, what price range? He said, I don't care. And my phone kept ringing for two solid weeks. Uh, I went, I took 250 orders in two days. By the end of the week, I had over 400 orders. And they still rerun that show and I still get orders. I, I'd probably say if I had to gauge, I've probably got eight, eight or nine hundred orders just from that show. And then it springboarded into just, it got crazy and wild. Every, every newspaper, every magazine wanted to interview me and not just knife, knife related stuff, sporting magazines, outdoor magazines, and then German TV, Italian TV, Spanish TV, the last TV crew that was here was a Russian TV crew came to my shop from RT News. Never heard of it. Mike Huckabee flew me to New York City. I was on two episodes of the Huckabee show on Fox News. It was crazy. Wow. And I didn't, didn't ask for any of it. God just gave it to me. So it was pretty wonderful. What, what do you think resonated with people so, uh, so intensely? You, you don't, you don't often think of knives as having such a, a broad public reach, you know, emotionally. What do you think it was that brought everybody out? By the way, my brother, uh, Victor was, was someone who called you initially right after seeing that. I remember him telling me that. Well, what do you think it was? Well, uh, if I had to, you know, pinpoint it, I would say a lot of people were telling me everyone else that they talked to from Wilmington looked like they were just going to roll over and die. And you just rolled up your sleeves and said, well, this is what I'm going to do. And, you know, that, that's the kind of guy I am. If, if I have to clean toilets to pay my house payment, 
somebody's going to get a clean toilet, you know? <laughs> uh, and I think that's what people that resonated with people was just, a, you know, like kind of a can do spirit, which, you know, that goes through knife making. What drew you initially to the process of knife making? Well, I, I grew up hunting and fishing and trapping and just loved knives and uh, had got away from it, you know, the, the outdoors for a long while. And uh, I used to do a lot of skateboarding across the United States. And I skateboarded in our town with a few brothers and their father was a custom knife maker. And uh, it was around 1999, and I had uh, I saw one of them at a, a local hardware store, and I asked how their father was doing and if he was still making knives. And they said, yeah, you should go out and see him. So I, I went out and I ordered my father-in-law a knife. And when I went to pick it up, uh, I think he just kind of saw me, you know, looking around the shop inquisitively, and, you know, I liked the, the smells, I liked the way things looked, I just, you know, I like that kind of stuff. And he said, Hey, why don't you come out and learn how to make a knife, you know, or make, you know, make a knife. And it just lit a fire under me. And I, from, from very, very early on, I spent Monday nights in his shop. And from very early on, I had goals and I have met and exceeded every goal that I, that I went at. And, uh, he is still a, a full-time knife maker, and, you know, in 2009, when it, it came out on 60 Minutes, I was a full-time knife maker, and I still am to this day. So what is your process? Do you forge your own metal? Take take us through the the genesis of a knife, the birth of it, and then all the way to the leather. Okay. Uh, first, I'm a knife maker. I I do stock removal. And I forge. I like both equally. I I never want to pigeonhole myself into one style. Mm -hmm. I, I I love doing both. And if I forge, you know, I start from raw material, forge the blade, grind the blade, heat treat it, finish grind it, you know, guard, handle. Uh, you do all that, and you know, you're mainly doing that on your grinders and in your you know in a knife shop. Well, mm -hmm. then. I finish in my knife shop, and a couple of years ago, I decided to dedicate another shop to leather goods, and uh, so I can take I can have a nice clean environment. And I've got probably I'm going to brag here. I've got probably one of the best set up leather shops in the country. <laughs> it is nice. I inherited a 50 year old or a 50 year leather crafters tools, uh, wow. and then I've got tons of my own and. Uh, you know, I love doing the leather work just as much as, as making the knives. And I, I do a lot of contract sheep work where, you know, some pretty big names will send me their knives and, uh, I make some really fancy sheaths for them. And then some guys will say, Hey, look, get my pattern number three out and give me 20 plain sheaths, you know? So I do that and it, it works out pretty good. I'm never bored with any process because I'm not, it's not like a factory where you're doing the same thing every day. Mm -hmm. You you get to flow around and do things. And, you know, frankly, if I want to go fishing, I'll go fishing and then <laughs> come in and work a little later. Uh, I love being my own boss. Now I do have a, a uh, board of directors, and when she says pay the house payment, we pay the house payment. <laughs> Not always fishing. Not every day. Not every day. So uh, the the leather work, I, you do all of that. I, I've seen, um, you know, looking through your Instagram page and looking on your website, some very intricately carved, um, I think that's what you call it, right? Carved or embossed leather carved sheaths. Or and tooled. Or tooled. And uh, so that's all you, huh? So yep. do you have um, in your shop, do you have a number of different projects going at once uh, in different stages? Do you have different knives in different stages and sheaths, etc.? I will, uh, on a dry erase board, set out in the knife shop and write out the batch that I'm in and, and who they go to. And 
I'll take that, those knives, finish those knives, take them over to the leather shop, finish those sheaths, ship them, then start another batch of knives. And during the holidays, it's, you know, it could be anywhere from five to 10 in a batch. But, uh, usually through the rest of the year, it's around all three to no more than four at a time, you know, and then if there's one that is for a big collector that is very ornate, you know, I may take that project on just by itself. And so there's nothing creatively coming else, you know, anything else coming into my, my thoughts as I'm, as I'm making that knife, right. you know, I'm making one right now for a collector in France. And, uh, um, it's, it's going to be by itself. You have, uh, a, a collector base. Tell, tell me about your customers. Who's buying these and, and, uh, D, I think you told me, uh, you and I were talking on the phone several weeks back and you mentioned, uh, in my area, there's a collector. I do recall up here in Northern Virginia. Yes. Um, one of my oldest collectors, um, used to work in, uh, in Washington, D.C. and he lives in Oakton, Virginia, I believe it is. And, uh, he, he probably has, I don't know, I'd, I'd have to go count, but he probably has upwards of, 30 to 40 of my blades and he wow. won't open up a, a letter with them. I mean, he just, he just cherishes every knife he has, mine and others. And he says, when I, you know, when I watch a movie with my wife, I'll, I'll pull four or five of them out and just appreciate them, you know, clean them and look at them. And that's his appreciation of the art. And then you have guys that are hunting guides in Wyoming that just beat them to death. And, I love both of them, you know? Yeah. Well, you got to love knowing that, that some of them are being taken care of like pieces in a museum and then others are, are living out their full destiny, uh, you know, in terms of just out there doing the work. Oh yeah. You bet. What are your favorite materials to work with? I'm, I'm, uh, currently I'm looking at a, uh, sort of a fighting buoy you made, uh, that has this gorgeous stag handle. What are your, what are, what are the materials you like to work in? Well, I love to work with stag, but it's just, there's the embargo has been on it for years and you can't hardly get it for, for any decent price whatsoever. So you don't work with it as much. Um, but we still, we can still readily get mammoth ivory. I love to work with mammoth ivory and, uh, all the exotic woods and even, even just plain Jane micarta, you, you can put some style to it, you know? You have to you have to look at a knife and say, okay, wait a minute. You know, I, I want to change directions on the handle, and it'll kind of tell you. You know, put a curve here, put a curve there. Uh, it's kind of like when somebody will say, "Is my knife done?" Well, the knife's done, but the sheath's not done. Well, what kind of sheath are you going to put on it? I don't know yet. The knife hasn't told me yet. You know, hmm. I have to look at a knife and say, "Hey, what kind of sheath would would this thing you know be in? What color? What tooling?" You know, what, what kind of style, what color thread. And basically it sounds really weird, but the knife tells you, you know. Well, that's uh, a writer's approach or an artist's approach more so than an engineer's approach. You think right. of an engineer as someone who, who very cut and dried has the plan soup to nuts and they execute it. And then there goes the knife out in the post, uh, post box. But you are operating more like an artist in, in letting. The work, to, to, you know, you're having a dialogue with the work as you're making right, it. Right. The other guys are the guys that love micrometers. I don't <laughs> love micrometers. <laughs> you mean to test how how uh, how thin it is behind the edge and all that? No, no, micrometers just to, to, for your for your measurements. You know, the, right. they'll say, "Well, this is exactly point two five two." I'm not that guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, how does your designing work? Do you do things out on paper or do you just go at it with the materials? What's your, usually, explain your process. Yeah. Usually I start on paper with an idea and, uh, it's always on graph paper and I always use French curves and French curves give you, you, you know, you might say, Oh, I can draw a really nice curve. No, you can't. You might so so do it. A pair of, you know, a set of French curves. You can adjust the curve and just make it perfect for the knife, you know, and, and then when you're done, the drawing is just sitting there and it's right. Right. You know, 
there, there's nobody that can sit there and draw a circle and it'd be perfect. But with a, it's just a mechanical aid, you know, that's, then they're just plastic templates basically. But I, that's what I use every time to draw out a knife. Well, you can, with a French curve, you can always find the right curve. And, yes. and I mean, for a long time, you know, I went, I, I came up through art school and for a long time, the, the French curve was a total mystery to me. I just thought it was some superfluous little thing that, that you bought with your rulers and, and your protractor. But I, I've realized in recent years, cause I like to draw knives that, uh, yeah, that French curve will give you exactly what you need. You just have to yes. orient it correctly. Yes. And you can change it as the, the flow of the knife goes. You know, you can move that French curve with the flow of the knife and it just as crisp and clean as can be. And then I'll take, I'll take that drawing and hang it on the wall in my, in my smithy. And when I'm forging, I can kind of forge to that shape, you know. And yeah. then when I take it over to the knife shop, I profile it to the exact shape and then go at it that way with grinding and things. So you keep mentioning the word flow. Like, what is that? How does that concept play into your knife making process? It, a knife to me has to flow. I used to build custom Harleys, choppers. And when you looked at the front wheel and then you went, you know, you're, you just drew your eyes all the way to the back of the bike. If something was leaning forward, it stopped your gaze. It didn't flow. Mm -hmm. Everything has to flow. It has to look like it's going fast when it's sitting still. And that's the approach I take to knives. I don't want anything leaning the wrong way. I want it to all, you can look at the tip of the knife and just flow to the back of the knife pleasingly, you know, and, mm -hmm. and when it ends up at the, at the, at the pommel of the knife at the rear, you just go, yeah, that's right. You know, that's, that's just the way it should be. So you're, you're, I mentioned the word flow and you go right to the flow of lines. And I yes. was actually, I was actually thinking about the flow in your process. The fact that you don't, um, you know, you're oh, not thing. adhering. Yeah. Rigidly to, uh, to some sort of no. schema that you set out. No, it's the, it's the exact same thing. I'll, I'll look at it as I'm making it and. One one process should flow to the next instead of being a stop sign. You know, it should right. you, you should your grind should flow next to the guard, should flow next to the handle, putting you know, putting that on. Everything needs to go together perfectly to me to make that good cutting instrument. Did you learn this from uh, from the gentleman knife maker uh, that lived close to you? I mean, is this yes. something you picked George up Trout. from your influences? I'm George sorry, what's Trout his name? Is his, is his name George Trout. And he 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 taught me a lot about symmetry. You know, you you've got to really look. I don't even know how many points you would have to look at on your knife that have to match. You know. It's a, it's, yeah. it, you, you, you literally try to get a mirror image from both sides, except for your mark. You know, your mark is on one side, but the, the knife itself and the handle, the thickness of the handle, the, the taper and the thickness of the tang, everything has to, to be in symmetry. Sometimes that's difficult, but you get a good eye, you know, you get a really good eye for it. In, in, uh, Grinding out the bevels side to side, it always, uh, in the, the few times I've noodled around in my backyard, it, the hardest thing that I always experienced was having one side come out great, but then yeah. flipping it around and imagining that I'm doing it exactly the same way and having it all yep. wonky. Well, and, and most, most of the time, even with the best, biggest name knife makers, another knife maker can pick up their knife. And tell if they're right or left handed hmm. just by, just by looking at the plunge lines, you know, and also I don't want my knife to look like a CNC machine spit it out either. It is a handmade custom knife. I've never made the perfect knife. If I did happen to stumble on and make the perfect knife, I'd probably never make another knife. I'd probably be done. Mm -hmm. Where could I go from there? 
also spoken like an artist. So, <laughs> well, yeah, it's true. You know, uh, it's it's probably the the frustration of not making that perfect knife that that keeps you going to the next one, keeps yeah. you going to the next one. Yep. And every knife so, of mine should show a little bit, you know, show a little bit of progress. And you know, I've been making knives since 1999. I'm well over 3,000 knives, and I still get the same jazz about it as I did the first one. And I, I you know, that keeps me rolling. I love it. So, what what is your favorite knife to make? Oh gosh, the knife with a point on one end and a handle on the other. All oh, right, on. <laughs> I'm I'm looking at several of those right now. Uh, you have this loveless uh, sub hilt fighter that's just. Uh, I mean, you've got uh, some amazing, amazing stuff I'm looking at here on your website. Thank you. And yeah, you're welcome. And and I like I like how you you are you do a lot of compound grinding too, which kind oh, yeah. of seems unexpected because uh, the knives have a an outdoorsy ring to them, you know. But um, uh, have you been? enticed by folders at all is there anything about the folding world that you find interesting yeah i i really like slip joint folders you know traditional and i've mm -hmm. made quite a few of them but when you're full time and you've got a lot of orders you don't have the time you'd like you know to mm -hmm. do on folders because folders take more time uh i am getting kind of a hankering to make a couple of them i I've always wanted a pearl handled slip joint for myself as a, what I would call a Sunday go to meeting knife. Right. <laughs> and I've got a premium piece of pearl sitting out there staring at me for the last four years. So I'm thinking I might do a little overtime and, and make a couple of folders in, in the new year. Well, yeah, four years you've waited. You deserve it for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You made a, a cotton sampler, which is a, a an interesting oh. and rare pattern to, to love, just kind of bust out with. It, it to me, they look like scalpels. They actually look like medical. Way, they, yeah, yeah, just the way that the there's that little area, I guess, for your finger to rest yep. up there on the ricasso. But uh, yeah, such a cool pattern. So you mentioned before uh, you don't want your knives to look like a CNC machine. Spit them out. What is your impression of the knife world as it's ballooned? Uh, and I don't mean balloon in a bad way. I just mean as it's grown kind of quickly over the last 10 yes. years. Well, uh, you know, the, the mid-tech stuff's out there. And, you know, the full-blown CNC knives are out there. And they all have a place. I mean, they really do. Um, I can watch a CNC machine spit out parts, and I'm, I'm amazed by it. But when mm -hmm. I... When I see steel move under my hammer and I feel steel move under my hammer, that jazzes me up. I really love that. Uh, and as far as like the, the knife world growing, it really has. Uh, a lot of it's called the forged in fire effect. <laughs> um, and a lot of guys are just jumping into this and they're buying tons of equipment. And probably what that's going to mean in the next five or six years is there's going to be a whole lot of grinders for sale. They're also burning down the neighborhood, by the way, Michael. They're burning down neighborhoods. You know, uh, it's going to it's gonna wind up like, hey, this was a lot of fun. Now my wife says she wants her garage back. <laughs> right. You know, and that's okay. I mean, you know, that's okay. Uh, but there's just a whole lot of guys jumping in right now. And their learning curve is a lot shorter with, mm -hmm. with YouTube and things like that. I, you know, I do a lot of Facebook videos on how I do leather work and how I, you know, how I grind. And I've gotten a lot of comments on that kind of stuff. And it, it's fun. You know, I have, I'm, if I'm known for one thing, probably if I could say one thing, I grind efficiently and quickly. And, you know, I'll have a guy say, well, a, a loveless dropped hunter, man, I can, I can grind one of those in a couple of hours. And then they say, how long does it take you to grind one? And I, about two minutes, I just, I learned how to, I'm a big man and I bear down on a great grinder and I get, uh, <laughs> and I have done a lot of work for factories that will send me a box of knives to grind for them. 
huh. I was told by a man, Larry Harley, who passed away a few years ago. He was a journeyman smith out of uh, Tennessee. He said, never turn down those side jobs. Never. He said, Pete Gerber called me one day and said, Larry, can you sharpen a machete? And he said, well, of course I can. He goes, can I send you some machetes to sharpen? He said, we don't have anything to sharpen these machetes in the Gerber factory. He said, and they came from overseas unsharpened. He said, how much? Larry said, two bucks a piece. The next morning, he had 6,000 machetes. Oh, my God. Oh, my and goodness. he told his wife, brew the sweet tea, leave <laughs> me alone. And he said, in one week, I sharpened every machete. He said, and I made 12 grand that week. Wow. He said, you don't get to do that very often. But when you do, take those side jobs. You know, I... I took a side job one time of grinding a small knife and it was, it was, it just went extremely quick. And I thought, how much am I making? You know, how much time am I putting in this? And it was just a little over a minute to grind both sides of it. Wow. And then they wanted it back and they were paying me 10 bucks a piece. And I thought, wow, prostitutes don't make that kind of money. Well, you got something better. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Got gotcha. you. You know, I, I, I don't mind taking those side jobs. I, you know, I'll go to the Blade Show in Atlanta, and there may be anywhere from five to ten guys that are in various stages of the, the knife game and age and everything where they need me to grind for them. And I'll do their grinding. And, you know, I don't mind that. It's just contract. I'm sorry. Why? Why would someone? Why would a knife maker have another knife maker grind his blades? Isn't well, if they're if they have a health limitation from from age, uh huh. But they okay. but they want to stay relevant for a few more years. You know, I got you. I see that as hey, you know what? I'll stay quiet. I won't say who you. You know, I won't tell anybody your name, and I'll just grind your knives and. You, you put them on your table and we're good to go. You know, and there's, there's a few brash knife makers that would say, well, that's just wrong. No, it's not. It's just contract work. People, people contract out their heat treating all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do that in your own house. There's nothing wrong with contracting it out. A lot of people don't make their own micarta or grow their own trees from which they harvest. That's the scales. exactly right. You can get very granular with that. Yes, you, you can. Know. In terms of the knife industry, do you, do you find it um, do you find it a welcoming place? For the most part, yes. Some of the new crowd, they don't have a sense of history, and I'm a firm believer in whatever you're doing. Have a sense of history of where it comes from. Skateboarding, study the old guys, know who they were, watch how they did things. Put your spin on that, you know, and and just just know know where it came from, know where it was birthed. And a lot of these guys, they just come in and go, "No, I'm just I'm just making this knife and love me." <sighs> you know, we've been at we've been at this game a long time, and we'll be at it a lot longer. And I see it every year at the Blade Show. We talk about it. Okay, hey, where was those two guys who really we're going great guns in the last couple of years. Well, they're not here. Their stars burned bright and burned out. Do you think that's more likely to happen in the folding sector because folders are more popular because more people can carry them? Is that endemic to that area or is it straight across that the board? And that and the mid-tech tactical guys. I don't know. It's just, it's all good. Knife, you know, all knives are good, but you have to go at it with the right attitude. Uh, I was talking to a good friend of mine today who's a world famous wood carver, and they have an association that puts on a big show. Well, this year was the very last show, 35 oh. years of it. And I said, "Why? Why are you having the last show?" He said, "We're all old. We're just old coots, you know." He said, "There's no young kids getting into it," and he oh. said, "We're going to go out on top." And, you know, I thought, that's pretty cool. Uh, it's sad, 
but they're going out the right way. And it's kind of hard right now to watch. There's just a few young guys coming into it when there should be dozens and dozens of guys that are 15 to 20. Uh, that's why at every blade show that I go to, and I've been to over 20, I will sit and I will watch. And it's usually on a Saturday. I'll pick a father walking around with, it could be a young boy or a young girl. And I don't pick the kids that are wearing a hundred dollar hat, and $500 sneakers. Pick the kid with the holes in his knees, you know, they're not walking around with knives that they've bought. They're walking around with a lot of brochures. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, they're just there to see the knife show. And I'll give the kid a really nice knife. Oh. I mean, a, you know, a nice knife. And I have seen so many tears from the fathers. And now I see a stair step effect every year at the Blade Show where these kids walk up that I gave a knife to 10 years ago, you know, and they're 20 and they're still coming to the show. So I'm planting seeds and I'm watering because <laughs> if I, if I die at 85, I don't want the knife business to die at, you know, die then I want it to go on. Uh, right. When I was a kid, I'm 58 now. When I was a kid, I had a knife in my pocket 24 seven at school, everywhere. The teachers knew it. You know, they would ask to use my knife. <laughs> you know, and yeah, I got into quite a few tussles with kids in school. Never once did I think about pulling my knife out. There must have been 20 trucks in, in our parking lot at school with loaded guns in the back window. And nobody ever thought about shooting the school up. Right, because no you one know. was a dangerous criminal there. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we had a few of those. <laughs> You know, right, right. A, but, you know, people took care of it differently. You know, if you got in a fight with somebody, it was, hey, you beat me up pretty good, you know, and you went on. You didn't pull a knife on them, but everybody yeah. had a knife. I mean, everyone had a knife. It's a tool. It's man's oldest tool. And if they ban knives, are they going to ban butter knives? Did Did you see how this, uh, the Church of England is demanding that all kitchen knives be sold blunted on the tips blunted so that you, oh my god yes yes rounded off <laughs> it's it's hilarious so i mean you, so you you sound to me like someone who's uh, got a, a firm appreciation for traditional uh for the value of traditional things yes does does a computer will a computer ever play into the making of a mockerly knife <sighs> Uh, as far as design, no. Uh, as far as making the parts, no. Um, I do use Facebook as a vehicle mm -hmm. for sales. And that seems to work out pretty good. That, but I don't have to dip my foot in too deeply, you know. Yeah. <laughs> my website is, is horribly old. Uh, and one thing that we're seeing in knife making is the websites are going the way of the dinosaur and it's all social media. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have to, I have to kind of roll with that, even though I kind of, you know, look at it and say, mm, that's not for me. I still have to do it, you know, or you'll get left behind. And I do this full time. If it was just yeah. a hobby, it really wouldn't matter. But I, you know, Quite frankly, you, when you're 58, it's kind of tough to reinvent yourself and go out and get a job. You yeah, know? right. And I love well, doing what I'm doing. The beauty of something like Instagram is that it's visual and it's simple and it's cheap. Unlike uh, managing your own uh, website, you know, I, yes. I've uh, come across, I've come across a lot of people on Instagram whose uh, work I've really fallen for, and I never would have known them. Uh, some of whom I've spoken to on this show. And, uh, you know, they're just posting up pictures from their shop or, or finished knives and it costs them nothing, uh, but a little bit of time. And, uh, yeah, it's, and, and people get, get in touch with them through yep. that website. Or, yeah. I mean, through that app. So it is pretty amazing. Well, with, with a website, people have to come to you. 
They have to come to you and they you know, have to seek out your website. With Facebook yeah. or Instagram, you're knocking their door down. Right. And whereas, you know, two people see your website a day, man, 20,000 people or more might see your post. And that plants the seed. You know, I, I can't tell you the last time. I really don't know the last time somebody said, hey, I, I want this knife off your website. It's, hey, do right. you still have that one available that you posted yesterday? And it works out great that way for me. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm anti-technology, but I ain't stupid. You right. know, that's a good, easy way to go. You're not anti-technology. You're just pro-old school technology. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like the knife. <laughs> Well, so, uh, Michael, tell everybody how they can find you and find your work and uh, get in touch with you and, and, and see what you have to offer. Okay. Uh, the best way is uh, on Facebook. My business site is Michael Papio Mockerly Custom Knives. And on Instagram, it's just Omockerly. And the reason it's Pappy, my grandchildren <laughs> one day said, hey, we don't know Michael. We know Pappy. And I said, wow. Uh, so I, I rolled it over in my tongue a few times, Pappy O'Mockerly. And it flowed really well. So that's, that's, yeah. that's the story. I'm, you know, that's what's going on. But yeah, you can <laughs> see. And that's up to date, uh, really up to date. A lot of videos, you know, uh, are on there that of me do, doing things. That's the best way to find my work or give me a call. You know, my, my, my phone number is on there. I, I, I don't like tapping on a keyboard to convey a message. Um, you know, give, give me a phone call. We can talk about this. I'm with you on that. I love it when you can just make a phone call, keep all yep. the typing to a, to a minimum. Yep. Well, Michael, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. I've I've handled your knives, as I've mentioned. My brother has two of them. By the way, you also got him hardcore into leather making. Uh, you don't know that, but cool. he does he does amazing stuff. He's made some incredible shoes for me, uh, and Good. I'm so glad I got a chance to talk to you. You left an impact 11 years ago when I saw your story, and uh, it was great to finally meet you. Awesome, awesome. That is great. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. All right, back on the Knife Junkie podcast, episode number 64. If you want to uh, catch some of the links to uh, maybe uh, Pappy's Facebook page that uh, we're talking about or some of the other uh, interesting takeaways or other resources, links, etc., you can uh, find those all on the show notes page at the knifejunkie.com slash 64. Every episode of the Knife Junkie podcast that you hear that we refer to the number, you can always look it up. So if you uh, want to go back and listen to an, uh, an episode of the Knife Junkie podcast, uh, it's just the knifejunkie.com slash the number. So this one, the knifejunkie.com slash 64. Bob, key takeaways, thoughts, what did you uh, glean from that interview? Well, a couple of things, actually. I'm I'm uh, reminded by my brother that uh, seeing that 60 Minutes episode is what got my brother into leather work, and he's made some amazing leather stuff. Uh, chief among them sheaths for me and a, and a uh, pit-fighting gauntlet Conan style, which I will show on the channel at some point. But, uh, yeah, he was inspired by Michael O'Markerley's kind of uh, vast plane of knowledge. You know, he's not only a knife maker, but he makes exquisite sheaths and, and is, you know, fantastic at leather working. To me, uh, as, as someone, as an artist, I, I hate to sound high handed, but as an artist, I'm impressed by, um, his range of knowledge in terms of how to use materials and being able to make a, a beautiful custom knife soup to nuts. And by soup to nuts, I mean from the start of making the knife to finishing up the sheath. That, uh, that to me is impressive. Another thing that kept ringing in my ears as he was talking was this concept of flow. He used the term flow a lot. And I think about that term a lot. I, I know a lot of people who are who are in the creative uh, fields or who are athletes uh, talk about flow a lot. It's that it's that space you get to in your head where you, you have enough 
expertise in how to do something, how to execute something to the point where when you're doing it, you're not thinking about how you're executing. You're just executing and you're in a flow state and you're just kind of forgetting time and forgetting space and just lost in that thing. And he kept mentioning that and it just really resonates. And uh, finally, now I'm going to be high handed again and I'm going to quote Seneca, the Roman Stoic philosopher, which don't worry, I don't do often, but uh, everyone's heard this. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Uh, as uh, Michael mentioned, uh, as soon as that 60 Minutes episode aired about his bad fortune, his fortune turned around, and that's because he was prepared, and that was his opportunity. He'd been making knives for quite some time, and then the show came along, and, uh, you know, one door closes, that's DHL leaving Ohio, and another door opens, and that's uh, the opportunity of starting a knife business. So, mm -hmm. uh, another inspiring story for me. All right. Well, that's what we'd like to bring you on the Knife Junkie podcast is uh, these great interviews and uh, conversations, if you will, with knife makers, knife manufacturers, anybody in the knife industry, YouTube reviewers. So uh, if you know of anybody that you think would be a great guest on the show or you yourself would like to be uh, on the show and have a conversation with Bob about knives, we'd love to hear from you. Call the listener line at 724-466-4487. That number again, 724-466-4487. And we'd love to chat with you on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie podcast. And to all of you who have already sent me suggestions, I've taken them all to heart. I have sent out many an invitation, and hopefully I hear back from these people. I know everyone wants me to have Ernie Emerson on, and so do I. <laughs> and I've sent a number of invitations, but he's a busy man, so hopefully he gets back to me. All right, we're working on it. Ernie, come on, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's going to do it for episode number 64 of the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, we hope that uh, you enjoyed it, and we hope you'll join us again this uh, Wednesday for our supplemental issue, that uh, number 65. That's when Bob's going to go over his uh, top 10 knives that he carried for all of 2019. So if you're looking for some uh, gift ideas, you can use the top 10 carried knives of the Knife Junkie as uh, maybe some guidance. So uh, join us midweek for, for that one. For Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. I want to thank you for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.